views on uh, what are the current trends and in the space technology domain and where do they see the near future around us. So I would like to request uh, Mr. Karanam to start with the panel. Thank you. So uh, the space industry today is uh, undergoing a transition from what it was 10 to 20 years before. So, if you look at the uh, space industry worldwide, uh, maybe 10 years down the line or even 20 years down the line, it was mainly space organizations and government agencies which was uh, pushing and handing over projects to private companies and uh, also agencies working by themselves to enable civilian applications. Uh, the world was building applications like uh, GPS that we have today and all the imaging capabilities, DT heads. And all these kinds of applications were coming up and it all required huge investment uh, in terms of satellite sizes. It was mainly big satellites being launched to geostationary orbits. And for that it required uh, investment of the order of 500 to 800 crores or even more in few cases. And all these were taken up by governments and only government could fund it. But if you look at it in the last uh, 10 years or so, it has been emergence of a private sector or a wave of new startups that are coming up, uh, taking up private funding and they are looking at uh, commercial markets for very specific applications. For example, just in the last five years, there are a number of uh, companies which are coming up with constellation of satellites. For example, there is a company called OneWeb which is doing uh, something equivalent to DT health in terms of internet. So they, they have a constellation of satellites which are going to beam internet directly to your devices, maybe to your phones or to your phone. So these kinds of applications are there and there are a number of uh, companies which are building uh, imaging applications. So when these kinds of private companies are coming up and working with private funding, uh, rather than one big satellite at a huge cost, companies are working towards a constellation of smaller satellites spread over different locations across the earth at much lower cost. And uh, this is in terms of satellites. And uh, with thousands of satellites that are bound to come up as compared to a few hundreds that have been launched in the last 50 years, um, there, is, there are going to be new market opportunities. Maybe uh, there is scope for uh, reusable launch vehicles which can take these satellites into <laughs> orbit, custom orbits. And uh, these companies have to be very fast, they need to come up with a very quick turnaround time to launch satellites. And uh, satellites are coming up with technologies called electric propulsion systems where Galatrix is also working on. Instead of chemical propulsion, we have new electric uh, propulsion, something like uh, electric vehicles in space. So these are kind of reducing the cost of accessing space and making them available. So, uh, so Mr. Karanam has touched upon an important point that the number of launches which we need in the coming decade is going to be a multiple of what we have had in the last decade. So I would like to uh, ask uh, Mr. Kiran Kumar to throw some light on whether this was the motivation to have the PSLV privatization program and what, where does it currently stand? No, primarily the aspect what you have to see is India started its space program to look at how the technology of space can be used for bringing in developmental activities, support the activities in the country. So it started uh, way back in 60s with the intention of providing communication, remote sensing, that's earth observation, and then added it navigation to that and also space science. So the prime objective the, of starting the space program in India was to ensure that we make the best use of the space technology for rapid development. Just to give a couple of examples, one was on uh, how to provide broadcasting capability, reaching to the entire country, starting with a simple site experiment, satellite inspection and television experiment. Then today you have got uh, imaging instrument which can take data, provide data from sub-meter resolution at the sub millisecond or millisecond intervals, etc. So one of the thing is how to make use of this technology for providing solutions to the problems we face is the way it started. But today the problem is for a country like ours, while the country has established the basic capability of launching, building satellite, building instrument, and converting all this into an application domain and providing inputs to the 
government as well as with others. The real issue today for us is to enable the country to make use of the technology that is developed and take, capture a part of the global market that is there. Based industry itself, if you look at today, it may be around 308 plus billion dollar market. And in the coming um, years, etc., it's going to increase steadily and it could even touch up to 500 billion dollars in a couple of five years. Now, how country can benefit on what it has done so far of establishing itself as one of the key players among the global uh, countries, fifth or sixth in various domains, how to build that capacity in the country. And building that capacity, while we have already made use of a large number of industries for becoming part of um, whether it's launch vehicle or satellite or application area, they are still doing it as part of ISRO entity. But if these entities have to make me provide opportunity, not opportunities, capture the market elsewhere, then they have to do it with the technological and the capabilities that are there. So the real task is that. And the question you asked of polar satellite launch vehicles being developed in the industry. Today, very recently, we completed the 50th launch of this vehicle. So the vehicle per se has all the, you can say, wherewithal for dealing with the variations of the environment and then be a successful launcher. Now we are getting into the process of engaging with uh, a consortium of companies and make them do the four stages of the PSLU. The right now the process is on. Hopefully within this year, they will get those uh, contracts and they will start operating. One of the key things is how to make this transition how to enable the industry within the country to provide solutions not only to ISRO, but more than ISRO, capture a proportion of the global market. That is the basic thing. And towards this work is in progress. There is a specific <coughs> program office which is built in ISRO, capacity building program office which is kind of and also NSIL, new space signal, which has been set up for this. Would, uh, Mr. Murthy, like to add? I, uh, I just try to address the broad uh, scopes building on both uh, ODFS and uh, Chikar and Kumar said. So we look at three or four large trends and, and a lot of our own thesis in terms of investing is based on these. Uh, trying to take what he said and break it down even further. I mean, one of the things we've noticed is that there are three key components of uh, space one. One is the cost of building a satellite. And the cost of launching a satellite and the cost of managing a satellite is launch. So the cost of building a satellite, uh, and we've seen kind of uh, a law uh, that not too many other people seem to have noticed, was about cost of building a satellite about 15 years ago was about a million dollars a kilo. Then it came down by half in five years to half a million dollars a kilo. Then it came down again by half five years ago to $250,000 a kilo. And now it's about $125,000 a kilo. The cost of launching it was at about one fifty thousand dollars a kilo. It's come down to seventy five. It came down ten years ago to seventy five thousand. It came down uh, five years ago to about thirty seven thousand. It's now about twenty thousand uh, dollars a kilo. The cost of managing it was again about a million dollars, uh, uh, you know, for three years by building a ground station. That's again come down similarly a million to half a million to one fifty to one twenty. So we're seeing every five years a fifty percent reduction in the three key costs, and this has actually resulted in literally the hockey stick movement. So we actually plotted a graph uh, every satellite launch from uh, Sputnik in 1957 to today. And you see that the graph is really, really consistent till about two, three years ago. There were not more than 50 or 80 satellites launched in any year. Last year, there were 1,600. This year, about 2,000 plus. Next year, about 4,000 plus. So we're actually seeing that hockey stick movement happen. A lot of it is, again, because the cost, the overall cost, right? take the total cost of ownership of a satellite, basically, the minimum viable satellite today is three kilos uh, over three years. Uh, we are able to do it consistently for about five, five to six crores versus 500 to 600 crores 10 years ago. So you can see it's been 100 times cost reduction. Uh, our own company, uh, Satellites, launched, uh, was India's first private company in space. We launched on SpaceX uh, in December 2018. We also launched on this was PSLV C45 in April 19. And uh, on 1952-53, we had another launch of eight or nine payloads a couple of months from now. So India's only private company which has actually launched into space. Uh, and we are able to see this cost come down. 
We understand that the number of satellites is going up. We hope to be the world's, at some point, one of the world's leading builders of satellites. Uh, that's one of our the scopes we see. The second interesting scope we see in space is, uh, just uh, like Sir pointed out, typically space organizations have been vertically organized. You go to NASA, you go to JAXA, you go to ISRO, you go anywhere else, you go to uh, off the coast of uh, right? So typically what uh, ISRO says, sure, you know, we will have to get the camera, we will have to put, put it in a satellite, and we have to put the satellite in a rocket, and we'll build all of that. And we'll put it in a launch pad, we'll build that also, and we'll launch it, and we'll control with the ground station which we have. And our engineers will download the data and they'll analyze it and we'll give it back to you. And it's what every organization is doing, a full stack solution. And hence, typically now, I understand there's a backlog at each of these places because everybody wants this and these are the full service providers. Where we see private enterprise happening is when you take this entire stack and slice it into various parts. So, for example, we believe each of these can be a separate company. So, we have an investment in a satellite manufacturing company, it's called Satellite, we have an investment in a uh, radio uh, payload company. Uh, it's, it's called HS Signals, we have investment in a ground station company, ground cloud, we have investment in a space data analytics company, and so on and so forth. In each of these areas, slices, we want to build out uh, competence in India and around the world to be able to do this. Going forward, it's not just 300 billion, we actually see this as a trillion dollar plus industry. Uh, we see the cost coming down every five years. And with that happening, we also think there's, there's yet another factor that, that plays in. In, we don't just see this only for India, we see India as a great place to build this for the world. And the reason for that is many of these sales are politically charged. So if you talk to many West African nations or East African nations, for whatever reasons they're not comfortable buying from the US, they're not comfortable buying from China, which leaves us in Europe. And we are about one fifth to one tenth the cost of a European solution. Okay. Uh, even while making a lot of money. So there are lots of factors and vectors that seem to be pointing us in the right direction. We started the fund two years ago. We're only the second space fund in the world. Uh, we've raised so far, we're raising 450 crores. We've so far raised 150. Uh, we hope to be, by the end of the year, raising all of it. And we basically see a lot of these movements happening where we can build great companies out of India and elsewhere to be able to service not just Indian needs, but global needs. Uh, global needs. And these can be really game changing needs. I mean, we can actually, on a mobile phone, uh, you know, a farmer can go in, press a button, and say, Tell me what my crops look like, tell me which part of my field is infested by what kind of parasite, and tell me which part of my field requires what kind of fertilizer. It's possible. It's possible today. Uh, there's a huge amount of ability to be able to bring this from the B2B into B2C into where the segment can actually start working uh, for consumers at any point in time. We're very excited and we hope at some point to get uh, plans from many of you uh, to be able to build out the Indian revolution space. Not too many of you know. That India has a 30-35% market share in small satellite launches globally. We are the world's largest launch destination. All right, for CubeSats and small sets. We hope to be able to take this along with this great manpower that uh, is through DRDO, DMR, DRDL, and trained for the last 50-57 years of more than 150,000 people who have been trained uh, that already exist out, out here, along with many of you, fresh grad, to be able to build out this new revenue.
now further when we talking about the uh, technology is improving the life of the satellite is increasing uh, because of the the launch vehicles are able to we are able to put over 5 year 10 year to 15 years so now the narrow is also has to be reworked on how to make sure that we get a reconfigurable things in the orbit because what we are launching today is has going to have a meaning even after 15 years so the relevance of the technology is also equally important and when we are talking about now future new area where the new uh, effort has to be made for the building a uh, a proof of concept, new proof of concept, whatever are there, they are getting into space. Now we have to see what are the new other areas which can be explored and that also has to go, uh, so we, what we need is uh, more uh, energy between the industry, the academic, as well as with the, with the state, uh, with government uh, or the public sector, I think that the spin-off of technology is also very, very important. Uh, so now coming to the, what Mr. Murthy said that uh, we could have, instead of having a one organization do everything, we can have several organizations doing a, a bit of it, a bit of it every time and they can do it much better because they are focusing on that thing. But uh, so while you doing this, do private organizations have access to the technology that already been built by, say, let's say, it's through, and rather than reinventing the wheel, they just take some work that has already been done and then try to so let me add before uh, Sir Rixi, I mean, uh, we won actually the ISO tender for VIT for that satellite. So we have won the Indian Consortium. So uh, we were actually L1 on that along with uh, Alpha Design. So our team is building uh, at least nine satellites of the 2000 kilogram class right now in ISO. Okay. It's a private team that is building it along with uh, new higher electronics and data advanced system that we are out there. Uh, that is picked up. That apart, as in is happy to commercialize technology. We are happy to participate. The only request we always make is, you know, make it more open to startups because the typical pre-qualification uh, norms that happen if you want to bid to be able to commercialize this sort of technology, and we have to fill it. I mean, one clause is five years ago you should have had 35 electronics engineers. We're saying our company is one and a half years old. <laughs> you know. So hence we have to partner with somebody else who who has been. So I think that's the only thing where, but uh, we have seen a lot of help in this room. But of course you can add some. Uh, or in that front, uh, the whatever technology uh, we in so we have to two school of thought. One is whatever we procure from out there, we try to indigenize that. And whatever we develop ourselves, we try to give to the industry because whenever it's a production or something or it, it's a, uh, utilization for uh, by by even tweeting or slightly modifying it and making it use for the other. So that mechanism already existing. And the, what you said, those type of those issues, if we address that, it will be such a Because the need of our has come now that we need to have it. Uh, it's more and more trust on it. Earlier, everything was being done uh, in house and uh, industries were given to build to build. So now when we are talking about them to take a internet goal, so then definitely this has to be there. And uh, uh, we have a mechanism in each center. There are five uh, each center. In each center it is uh, possible to, to get the announcements keep on happening. And also through headquarters, that is the DPO department, the country building. So there are also the opportunities are being announced. And it is the mechanism where hand holding also has been done. Even after the technology transfer is there, the, the commercial aspect as well as the, the technology to be one challenge which I have seen is that sometimes the electron whatever we develop that also we have to be re engineering because the, the, the time factor, the timeline is very important. Suppose we build something today and we give technology after three years or four years. By the time some obsolescence of the components also happen. That engineering also has to be done. It is not a straight away, sometimes goes. Other than this, it is easy. So, while you are working on new kind of technology development, as well as the future, so do you, uh, what kind of challenges do you face with respect to building technology or having some kind of technical mentorship in doing this? Or it may be as simple as something very crucial for development of space systems to be having the appropriate specification. So what are what are your thoughts on 
sort of mentorship that uh, i feel was very much it because you would have seen in many forums that uh, the students may not be accessible so from our experience it has been uh, like a block in communication mainly so the organizations might have facilities and they may have already set up a internal policy to open it up for support industry but the industry may not know it to be Right as a startup, I sit here and I try to look at it online. Maybe things are not there online, or I might not have gotten into the right source or gotten the right kind of support. So I think some uh, somewhere it has something to do with this access chain in between that should uh, make it like a process of <coughs> make things more straightforward and easier. I think recently, just uh, last month or so, DIDO released a, a separate policy for technology transfer where. They are directly transferring technologies to various companies on uh, few critical technologies which were currently DIDO held directly. So these kinds of things are coming up, and I feel in future there's a lot of scope for uh, private companies to also access these facilities and uh, technologies. And also with respect to uh, what Mahesh sir said about uh, minimum uh, revenue that a company has to meet and performance plan guarantee. And I think there can still be scope to work around it because it happened in our case where sir was uh, supportive in waiving off the bank guarantee and looking at our revenue status. We were a zero revenue making company when we got this contract. So I think that is, should be possible, but uh, not in all cases. Maybe if you are working on technology which is of also interest to maybe a government agency that can support that, it could be possible. Yeah. We never had any testing issues because not just in ISRO and even in ISRO facilities, but but even the private sector, and especially in Hyderabad, there's a huge amount of testing. Whatever you want, sinusoidal vibration testing, you want uh, uh, heat testing, you want thermo testing, thermovac testing, it's all there. It's all there in the private sector. You can negotiate and pay it. Uh, it requires a little bit of money, but that still is a fraction of what it would require if you were to do it uh, outside of the industry. This is one of the challenges to what kind of law and act should be there. See, because without that, also a lot of things happen. Even not having a law itself is an active, is a in some ways a strategy up to some point. But same strategy may not work as the time progresses. If you look at today, space is what we call as the new frontier, the ultimate frontier. And today you are talking of people, space tourism, space adventure, <laughs> space exploration, space exploitation. Lots of things are happening. And lots of things are happening with the private enterprises fully funding and doing. In fact, if you look at globally, Elon Musk is actually the person who is ferrying things for America to station and back and etc. So a lot of things are happening. And like in the earlier cases, when any new area emerged, human beings are going to their commercial and their entrepreneurial capabilities such that it takes them far. So today we are at a stage where space is becoming one such thing, so like what you was talking about, even not billion, it could be one trillion dollar economy where you are looking at even asteroid being mined and some of the material that can be very useful for use on Earth or colonies, etc., etc. So the real issue is today, if you look at any object which is in space, if something happens to it, 
or it becomes a source of something happening to somebody else, who is liable for that? That is one key question where the governments and the, even the United Nations is trying to look at what kind. Today, the state to which the person or the company belongs is responsible for such a thing. So the obviously what happens is the government has to worry about how to make sure that you can support the company. Obviously, you don't want the company to be overloaded with this liability clause and insurance and the money to be spent and how much liability is there itself is a big question. So this is one of the real problem areas where it's not very easy to make um, the act or the law come through. So India is also grappling through that and uh, it has to find a way of dealing with this effectively so that the companies are not um, liable for too much of uh, compensation in case what they have done gets into a problem. Government should be able to support. But at the same time, in any democratic setup, you can also imagine anything you do can be questioned. So that's another thing. If you want to even keep in the law a mechanism where you say, okay, the company will be liable only for this much beyond that everything government will take. There will be hundreds of people questioning why that should be done, etc. So notwithstanding all this, uh, the processes are on. Hopefully it should come out. But the real issue would be how to make the entrepreneurs and the commercial set of people take advantage of the capability that exists in the country and bring in more, you can say, returns for the people and then they also prosper. So that is a real issue there. So we we'll still have to wait and see how the whole thing develops. So if I can again talk from an experience out here, uh, as uh, as we said, not many people really understand that the lack of a space, a space policy is also a very good thing. You know, uh, in fact, our first effort we launched on SpaceX after proving to them and writing that we don't have a space policy. Right? So the absence of a policy was considered permission for us to do this. And so so what we launched it. Uh, so. However, there, there are three key issues out there that uh, policy should handle, but even the proposed space policy at the right now does not handle. So one issue, as we said, is uh, liability insurance. So, for example, we have startups, right? We would like the startups to be in India. As of right now, in India, the policy or whatever, like that, or whichever you can call it, puts the entire liability on the company. In fact, when we discussed with this for a launch, the first thing they said is get us insure the launch. And we could not find a single space insurer in India who was willing to underwrite it. So guess what? I personally underwrote it. All right? It could have wrecked me. Right? Uh, but this this is not scalable. We have to do it because that's what we are supposed to do. We are stakeholders, but we can't do it on a long-term basis. Right? So the first issue is liability insurance. It's it's a big issue. Uh, the reason I say this is there are at least 50 countries in the world where my startups can move to where the country directly says, "You come here, I will cover the entire liability. Don't worry." All right? So already there's it's complicated there on the country-to-country -country basis. So that's the first one. The second issue is is communication frequencies, okay? So you send a satellite up, it has to talk down to Earth, and you have to talk back to it. For you to talk back to a satellite, you need frequency permission. All right, now you want to talk back at high speed. Are you doing it at 4G, 5G, whatever, you suddenly have to now bid for spectrum. The government says, okay, Airtel has paid so much for spectrum, Geo has paid so much for spectrum, you pay for. We have to explain, look, we are not doing spectrum for cell phones on Earth, we just have to point it up to the sky. But still, we are not allowed to do that anymore, all right? So it's a huge decision. Again, competitively, there are several other countries that give us spectrum easier. And it's, it is an extraordinary problem. I mean, it took us three months in each case to beat the spectrum issue to get the IARU approval for the frequencies that we needed to use to be able to do it. That's the second one. Right? The third one is actually <clears throat> an issue with the space policy itself. And I, and, and maybe uh, uh, both the gentlemen sirs can tell us more about it. But the proposed space policy is a little retrograde. It says that if you are trying to make anything that goes up in space, you have to keep a separate book of accounts. Uh, you have to declare the cost, the buyer, your profit margin, everything, all the technical drawings, all the IP is under the control of the government of India. But this is a complete killer. It's almost like saying, I don't want the IT revolution to happen because dear Infosys, before you sell anything abroad, you will have to have a separate book of accounts. You have to tell me who you're selling to, what your price is, what your profit margin is, who is the guy who's working, give me the uh, source code, and I will decide if you're allowed to export. Right? So rather than having a regime where everything is allowed and some things are forbidden, for example, I'm very happy you say, look, guys, you can do everything, but it is forbidden to sell to China, it is forbidden to sell to Pakistan, of course I will support it. But here it is the opposite. Everything is forbidden unless I allow it. 
which means should I scratch my nose, you have to wait for a you know government approval to may I scratch my nose. Right? The new space policy, it's not yet gone up. It, it is in discussion, and we are one of the uh, people who are trying to influence the direction of it. Is retrogressive in the sense that it makes everything you do in space entirely under the control of government. So we have an issue with that. We are trying to work with the government on that. I am on the CIA Space Committee myself, but it's a long, long run out process. So I think these are few of the things where startups will will have an issue and will will uh, will, will face an issue going forward. Because imagine keeping a certain set of books where the government controls everything, right? People say, I don't bother about this. I go to another dot com. I'll launch another taxi app. I'll do e-commerce. I'll do space where government is uh, has you know does not allow you to build the business in space. So these are a few. I, I have no view on this. I mean, uh, these are I I start with the assumption of goodwill. Nobody has bad them, and it is a matter of each party educating the other. And obviously, government has compulsion. You know, has something. Oh, what if you make something for Pakistan? I'm saying that rather than ban everything and allow a few, I'd rather you allow everything and ban. It. As said, it's not that the government is trying to do what he's telling exactly. But, it, <laughs> but space policy doesn't tell what they are selling. Anyway, we can debate this outside. <laughs> That's not an issue. But the real problem is even in there, what is being attempted is for all those activities where you yourself are not responsible for any eventuality that happens in space, there is no restriction. There is really no such thing as what you are talking about. The real issue comes is only when you are doing it, when you, what you have put in space gets into the problem. And when you are doing putting it there, for what you have done and what activity it is doing is what is being attempted to be looked at. For that, of course, there are means of doing it, maybe the point in question, but intention wise, there is no such thing as what you are doing. I assume good intent. I always assume good intent. So uh, moving on to, uh, let's say now we have several uh, industry partners who are coming in to maybe do the bitwise as Sir had highlighted. So, but uh, let's say now it is one of the organizations which is planning to lease out and uh, keep this part of it, let some company handle it. So, but there is always a notion associated with that uh, it should have reasonable space heritage before it could be allowed uh, to be part of. Uh, before it be given a content. So what are your thoughts on? No, I think here the scenario is changing rapidly. The most of the time what happens is the way the technology and capability builds, most of the governments are only trying to try regulate it post. So it is not, the, the governments do not, uh, are, can, uh, are not in a position to foresee the development that's happening in the thing and a priori set up mechanisms. That is where lack of policy itself is one good <laughs> thing in some ways. Where the idea is not to restrict anything. The real issue there in the space technology today is by the very nature of it, the object once it is in space, it is in nobody's land. And if it interacts with something else and causes problem, who is going to pay the consequences of that? That is one. And in India, you have another peculiar situation because of the various acts of... Uh, the related to terrorism and these kinds of things, how and also the nature of the work itself is not totally independent of uh, implications on that. That is where both the things become really difficult for uh, governments to deal with that. But notwithstanding that, um, like you said, today if you see the number of companies which are entering into this business and they are moving at such a fast pace that. Um, Definitely, India will be among the leaders in the years to come in many of these uh, space technology capabilities, etc. The government has to find a way of supporting and enabling it in spite of the difficulties it has got in dealing with issues the way it exists. Okay. So, uh, now moving on to the last segment of uh, today's discussion. So, I would like to know, as in uh, we want engineers to stay in India and who will be working on this booming market which we have. So, uh, how does academia play an important role where it has a certain safety net for students to stay in an academic setting, design some kind of experiments as Salman said? How this could be later taken up to a stage where an industry is built up? So, I'd like to hear some views from the panel on this. Like how academia plays an important role and uh, what 
still uh, if you are studying in college and a uh, facility like this iit bombay right? i think this is the most conducive kind of atmosphere for you to build on new technologies and uh, the age is also right because you are at the very you have not even started your career and you have options to explore a lot of options i mean you can decide what to do right you can plan into a job or you could try um, try to build a company also when you, when you look at space entrepreneurship what we are talking about today you have ample freedom and uh, coming uh, graduating from iit later also in case the company doesn't do well right worst case you have multiple options to look out uh, in life so i think this kind of um, background and maybe with the facilities that the institute has today right you have almost everything um, that you would require for a lab scale model to be qualified i think uh, academia is the right stage for you to start experimenting and uh, try building out something uh, especially in any technology area i think this is the place and uh, i think from there it is up to you your call right whether you want to go for higher education you can still do this and probably the benefits of it you could take it into the rest of your career and if you are doing entrepreneurship i think uh, coming from a uh reputed institute or uh, forget iit even from any institute right if you have the kind of degree you will be able to pull out a company and uh, like contribute your uh, thing in the space and the other thing is uh, you would get good number of interns uh, who would also later orient themselves into this and probably help you build the company and as you said engineers will stay in the country one of the reason major reason for brain drain is also that uh, people tend to go to higher education and then they um, then there will be circumstances for which they cannot return back at least for 10 20 years so if you are building the right kind of companies here if there are ample opportunities within the country where you can build on some of the cutting edge technologies right here in india with Uh, your families maybe this will definitely become a more uh, interesting proposition for students who want to probably go out and work they can be here do the right thing and uh, over time i think even the space salaries here in india is growing up i think uh, we can revert the thing so i have uh, actually three comments on what he said i mean uh, as uh, i mean there are at least 100 proposals from for students and satellite set is through and uh, we've seen a few of them in fact that iit bombay is working on a company to launch it uh, in a few months time i think what we have seen from that is most of them are just proposals aimed by somebody wants to put it on their bio and get a job at amazon or something you know here yeah. it's not, they're not to be serious it's in fact the program and it's a bullshit satellite you want to send because you want to put something on your resume there's nothing new in it or innovative or etc about it so There is one thing to do where you just go to a resume point of view. I just said that. In fact, one of the problems we have right now is a bunch of Indian students, students satellites are because the minute it's launched, the student has lost interest because he's put it on his resume, he's got a job and he's selling to places where he works. He has no interest, right? And satellite is still orbiting. Nobody cares. Nobody is taking care of it. It dies. It burns. Nobody has any idea. Right? So there is one issue there. That's one. That the interest we're seeing is not serious. It's more like I'm giving us interest. I would love to see serious interest. I would love to be able to support it. You know, one of the colleges they're supporting wants to see, for example, seeds can germinate in space. It really got us thinking: How can I send, you know, agar or you know, you know, a liquid solution into space? And so they are happy to work on serious issues. The second thing is uh, a lot of the education here seems to be unidimensional. Either you are electrical, or you are mechanical, or you are auto electronic. But guess what? To make a satellite, you need all of this, right? You need to be a, you need to understand the electronics. You need to understand communication. You need to understand the mechanicals, correct? Because the way now knowledge is siloed. I mean, literally, when you build a satellite, you need to be able to put all of this together. And we find that, especially in the more premier institutions, uh, less forthcoming. We actually find that in a lot of self-taught students in the in what we call tier two, tier three colleges. Our best engineers and across our companies are not from IIT simply because maybe they have, they are really focused on the engineering as opposed to trying to get a job in a good place. Okay, so I think that's the second thing because they the the knowledge is multidisciplinary, and that's what we really need. Uh, Out here uh, in this market, the third thing is, you know, some students haven't yet realized that, for example, if you go to the US, you will not be allowed to work on any sensitive space product, right? Because US law very clearly says the government and unless you're a citizen, you're not going to be allowed to do that. Which leaves you basically with Singapore, China, and uh, Europe, Singapore, and India, right? 
So US is not really a great option if you want to do something in space because you can't go far. The, the, you know, there are strict government laws and we allow citizens to do that. So there is a bit of an advantage, but but you're right. I think we are, we would love to see things which are not copycat and not just non thing. And we would love to be able to support it. And I'm sure so, so would Israel and others in terms of if it's a serious project with some serious R&D potential, not just, sir, I want to build a satellite. And, you know, that enough students have done in the last 10 years and all get one, you know, five square inches in Sunday, midday in Bombay. And after that, it's forgotten about. Okay. These have to be serious reports and they're happy. I am happy to support them. I would love to hear what, sir, has to say. Uh, I will say uh, uh, I work with uh, Kiran Kumar sir, so uh, I found that we were always students only. When right now also, whenever we are learning from uh, the day when you were any project, I was I did my project in my MTech project in, in, in ISRO, and thereafter I got a job. Um, what I'm saying is, still we are doing the project as a student project only. The only thing we are really learning and, and new things. But coming to this point that. Even when some people join the school, they also leave. Okay, after doing three years, four years. But then the the it, it's more like it's not a, a group or the affiliation to the university who have to take care of our work. Not the only uh, student. The student will you cannot say the student cannot be like as you say laws they cannot allow that. So he has to conduct the his profession. But only thing is when we talk about like we have uh, space that they call self. Uh, yeah, there's people are focused. There, there are professors, there are different professors are taking projects. They are after interacting with us, and then we they involve their students and uh, their GRF and FRF. But they are all a small part of a full system, not a full fledged FRF. So now uh, the the uh, there are two ways of looking at one is the existing program, they how they can be helpful. Around they in the future how they can be in the existing one they can come and do project in, in, in our centers also and they can work for that they can fit in their FTC cell and do something for us but for the future we have to see that the key has to be shown that they they the the incubation centers which are there so there they have to uh, have a, some excellence in some domain and then uh, fortify that into an area. So it's not, it's not a one year or two years. It's, it's a it's a this journey which which they are, uh, the desire has to be there. The team has to be geared up, not the only single one. That's what, uh, and we have seen that uh, many of the universities that uh, all IITs and uh, students are not uh, many of students are not there in our even in, in, in my department also. Uh, but we got some all uh, students from uh, who did contributed work from the regional colleges or NIDs. And they are doing because of the teamwork. They are groomed. They are they are kept bonded with them with the with the sub. And unless until you have that also, that will be missing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things is actually the this issue of uh, today. Like what Mahesh was telling, how much of the activity that is being taken is serious, etc. But India as a country and the intellectual capability of the Indian minds, if you see, there is tremendous potential to make use of this fourth frontier or the final frontier of space. And for this, if we have to make a serious impact, one is academics have to find ways of bringing in new thinking process and not doing what is something already done. See, many times we have to look at things very differently from what others have done. Otherwise, we will continue to be doing the catch up. One of the examples I would give is, see, for example, when we were building some of the high resolution imaging instruments, at one point, we were able to go ahead of others in the civilian domain. We had built the best imaging satellite for almost about five years, it was in the civilian domain, domain better than anybody else's in the world. It was possible because the team looked at what existed in literature, but what existed in literature had not been converted into reality because at the point it was conceived, the enabling technologies were not there. Enabling technologies of uh, maybe five axis robo machine or interferometric testing methods, where a particular surface you have to make it hyperbolic with very high polishing accuracy, etc. 
But we were able to look at that and then we found that this particular telescope becomes very compact and today's technology when we did in the 90s, it was possible to realize, though it was very complicated, it had a very high degree of alignment requirement, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But the point is, it's always possible for us to look at finding solutions to the problems in a manner which is very different. And also, if India as a country, if we look at our problems are very unique, we have many issues which need to be tackled. And for tackling those issues, if we make use of space as a technology element, and then find solutions to that, we will be definitely moving ahead of others in many areas. And we can become actually, actually like what he was pointing out also, the entrepreneurs can take up this and then find the suitably modify the solutions to the needs of the other countries in the world. So there is a tremendous opportunity here, tremendous opportunity, both because India is now at a point in space where economically it is growing and then there is more opportunity for the people. And if academic institutions look at the problem and then set up some serious mechanisms where across the student groups year after year, they can address a problem. See, for example, today, if you see IIT Madras, just the other day I had gone there, they are doing. So they have already done a first 3D printed semi cryogenic engine they have done. So even ISRO has not yet, uh, actually developed such a 3D printed uh, thing. So in the same manner, there are many issues if you look at space frontier when we are talking about today the cost of access to space is such that tomorrow's energy solutions which could come from space if it has to get implemented it's only possible if you make the cost of access low that means there are some problems which can be little long term but definitely if work is done today on that we could bring it ahead of others and the kind of problems will be today if you are talking about 10 to 20 kilometer per second as a velocity you are talking of hundreds of kilometers per second as a capability and then propellantless propulsion system there are a host of problems now academics area the real issue should be which are the long term ones where we can make an impact and other one is how to find solutions to the problems we have today here on the for which we can find solution from the space technology and how to make that happen. If we can start thinking on these lines, definitely the role of academia in the country's uh, problem solving is enormous. And today we really need to build an appropriate bridge between the agencies which have the fund apart. One is government, other is even private enterprise also. They are ready to probably fund like what is telling if there is a good uh, group of people who are ready to commit themselves and pro do solution. In fact, I have come across a small group of people who are working on a hyperspectral satellite to be put into orbit and then using those hyperspectral data providing solutions to agriculture and some of these things. And there are many opportunities that are there for uh, these opportunities to be converted into realities. It is the need is having more uh, intense interaction among the concerned people and work with the intention of making things happen both in short term, mid, mid term and long term. And uh, as I see, these things are now developing more and more. Like what he himself has pointed out, today in India, there are a number of uh, entities other than government which are working on these kinds of problems. We need to coordinate all this and try to make it um, happen. I'm very confident that in the coming few years, you will see more and more of uh, India's enterprise capturing the global market. Opportunity is fantastic. Only thing is the person who wants to enter has to commit that this is what I'm going to do. It's a risk. If you do not take risk, you do not get returns. But risk also is there of a failure. And unless you are ready to take that risk, that is where one other thing that is also said is the Indian students, they are extremely good, they are compliant to most of the thing, but they are not ready to take a, a new path. In fact, some time back, engineering design had come out with an article. It was making a comparison between students of different countries and their ability to deal with newer things and all that. One other person was told, 
he has to report it at some place for his work. And then that person calls back and tells, there is no road, there is no path for that place, how will I reach that? Then he was told, we want you to make a new path. <laughs> so anyway, point is, opportunity is there and uh, I'm sure things will work out and uh, we will see India making a big headway in the new frontier. Okay. Uh, Thanks, Anirudh, for moderating such an insightful discussion. Uh, looking at a different perspective, sir, we have a problem lying in front of us. You know, the, uh, we don't know when is Earth going to get destroyed. Who, who's, who's your question here? Uh, and all, all of you. Huh? <laughs> like, we have a problem lying in front of us. We can't wait for it. Like, uh, the start of Indian space journey took place because we were solving technological problems and uh, uh, like uh, getting ourselves televisions and mobiles, etc. But there is a different problem lying in front of us. That is the end of the earth. So, you know, how could uh, space entrepreneurship help us, you know, make humankind survive the journey of the destruction of earth? Australia, okay. like, you can't be sure of anything these days. Yeah, that's correct. One day all things are going to end. That's it. Anyway, you know, not coming to that. See, I would like to correct you at this thing. It was not the technological problem that was there. The space technology is used for addressing problems on Earth and on ground and in India. See, for example, today, based on space technology, you are providing information about weather, where the cyclone is going to come and how this to save the lives of the people and how to provide to the fishermen specific information or where he has to go for fishing and then crop assessment, climate change, so all these are capabilities you are generating from using space technology, which means putting some objects in space, looking at her and monitoring and studying. So the whole objective of this is not to develop the space technology for the sake of space technology. That's how India has done it very differently from the rest of the thing. And uh, the whole idea has been how to address specific problems we had on uh, ground and then how to tackle them using this technology. So that's how things are moving. But as you become more and more uh, economically stronger, you also have so many other aspects to be addressed. That's how some changes do take place in this. But otherwise, space technology in India primarily is harnessing technology for societal benefits. So just to answer specifically, I mean, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you talked about the ozone hole. Right, the ozone layer. You don't talk about it anymore because the hole has been filled because enough space technology was able to point out the hole, enough laws were passed to stop fluorocarbons, the refrigerator manufacturers have to comply, and now that was is being prepared. <coughs> Similarly, this is, you know, you will need lots of metrics, you also need people on that, you need Greta Thunberg, you need, you need many COP25s, COP26, you know, you, you need many such confidences to be able to come back, change the laws, cut the emissions, to be able to reverse climate change, or at least slow down, you know, climate change. So space is just, space is a neutral technology in place, so you can sit there and do anything from there. But certainly, those are some of the things that we, that we can actually uh, use to monitor and help influence the laws to be able to change industrial behavior. Sir? Uh, I'm your number four. Uh, right. Yeah, thank you very much for a very good uh, discussion and other things. Um, what uh, we, we have already pointed out that there is a holistic graph for launching all these satellites. So that is increasing the degree in the space. So don't you think that we have to start uh, training the space screening stuff? Yes, that's certainly one of the areas we look at. But I just want to put this in perspective from my personal point of view. So currently, you know, there are probably 500,000 objects in space of 10 centimeters or more. I just want to say that uh, there are more cars on the road of Bombay then there are objects in space, 600 kilometers over here. So space is still very, very voluminous. There, there's still lots of empty air. I'm not poo-pooing it. I'm saying it is there, it's a priority, but it is not yet as bad as we think it is. We are looking at these three different companies, one in India and two outside India, that have various kinds of debris solutions, debris cleaning solutions. Of course, the challenge is who's going to pay for it. It'll happen. I think it'll be there. Finally, the economics will really determine what will happen. See, until you reach a point where it is economically hurting you, people will not put money in. That is a problem. See, like what we pointed out, technology is neutral, science is neutral, but the people who use them, they are not neutral.
today one of the problems we have is in our desire to get rapid returns we are ready to do ignoring all the consequences of what we are doing with respect to ecology with respect to environment that is where monitoring and then bringing out and telling the impact of what you have done is this you be better be careful otherwise like what he is telling tomorrow planet earth may not be livable <laughs> Just to add to that, so uh, I mean, from what I have been seeing in the industry, there has already been an uh, emphasis laid on space debris mitigation and uh, deorbiting whatever satellites are going up. Uh, and there are close to uh, ten companies worldwide, uh, well funded either privately or through government agencies. And there are also government agencies which are working on deorbiting satellites. And there are universities which are working on solutions. I think any technology it starts like this. People will realize the need. And then somebody will start working on solutions, and when the problem gets mainstream, uh, VC comes in, and uh, bigger companies comes into the same game, and everybody is going towards it. I think that has started and will come. And uh, in a, in a policy that was released this year by the U.S. government on private satellites, they have made it mandatory for uh, all uh, uh, micro <coughs> plus size, right? It's all small satellites, medium and large satellites. To have their own onboard propulsion system, and for uh, U.S. companies to get the FCC licenses, they have made it mandatory for them to uh, prove that their satellites can be deorbited, so that in future there are no debris uh, taking place. And oh, yes. even by getting licenses, uh, SpaceX got license for many satellites, and they had a plan to deorbit. And even after that, uh, many about a few hundred satellites were launched by SpaceX and uh, there has been some problem that astronomers are facing. Astronomers are not able to uh, clearly witness the sky and make observations. So this has already been pointed out by people and uh, there are already forums discussing about it and it has already been taken as a serious issue and Elon himself tweeted that in future satellites he is going to work on solutions to ensure that uh, this environment problem is not occur. So these things I think it will happen as and when the need comes. You don't just deorbit. For example, our satellites that we launched are, are specifically designed with every material to burn up in space. So actually, nothing will come to earth. So not only will they will they actually naturally degrade because they are in lower they are in orbit below five feet, so they naturally degrade. But they will burn on reentry. So, so I want to add here just this quickly. Even the ICRO also has one monthly object tracking radar, which is taking care of all the debris, uh, not, not, not all, watching. but watching it and making a catalog of that. I like the NASA is uh, yeah. My question is more about entrepreneurship. Actually. Uh, if you look at the statistics today, like uh, maybe ten percent of less companies are successful in startup or program. So, uh, and especially when you look at the entrepreneurship in space, then it will become much tougher actually compared to regular startup. So, uh, the question is like this. Many students, when they are passing out and they ask them what they are going to do, they say, we are going to open a company. So typically, I give them advice that first go and work in a startup and get an experience that what startup means, then only think about startup. So I just want to know, like, is it a correct advice or not? So uh, it's true that 10%, not just of space startups, less than 10%, any kind of startup will succeed. But so what if you fail? Nobody dies because of failure. You know, it's not like it's more dangerous to cross a road because if you cross the road outside ID Bombay, you can die. Yeah. <laughs> but if so, you start a company, the company fails, you won't die. Yeah. Right? So it, it, failure is, I mean, failure means what? No, so I, I'm not discouraging them from entrepreneurship. I want them to be more successful so that they get an experience that what is required to be entrepreneur. Many of these students, they are just emotional about something. The reality is not. No, that's the point which I want. So, if you just do problem, you know, so I mean, if you say that my chance of failure is 0.9, correct? Yeah. yeah, let's say. So, if I start two companies, what is my chance of both failing? 0.81? <laughs> if I start three companies, what's the chance of all three failing? 0.72? Okay. If I start four companies, what's the chance of the failing? By the time you do a sixth company, you have more than even chance of success. Okay. I'm just playing a probability loss game, right? But put that aside. I mean, failing means what? It just means you still earn your salary, you didn't earn a lot of money. It doesn't mean, I mean, why are we scared of failure? Who cares? I mean, no, no, I'm, again, I'm, yeah. again, I want to tell the story. It's not about the failure. It's just that chances of success will increase or not if they... But take about it. I mean, Infosys has 125,000 employees. What is your chance of success there? It's much less than chance of success by starting your own company. Right. 
right? Amazon has 25,000 people in India alone, I think. What is your chance of becoming Jeff Bezos? Almost nothing when you join. So if your choice is between being an employee and being an employer, I think you have a better chance of quote unquote life success being an employer than being an employee. What? Right? I think uh, the real issue is there is no foolproof answer to this. <laughs> the real point is unless the person has a commitment of doing what he wants, irrespective of what success he gets in the short run, etc., if he is prepared to take that risk, we can definitely see what has happened by a large number of cases. Those who are pursuing will definitely succeed, not maybe in the first attempt, but in a later attempt. But if you are saying that can we prepare all the people for succeeding in every effort they are going to do when they become an entrepreneur, that is a question we need to address. I don't think it answers. No matter how, if, the more you train everybody, the failure rates will still be the same. Just, I mean, it's logically followed, right?